is what really gives me the most enthusiasm is the young people I meet, the docs, the the uh, students at UCLA and everywhere I go. They're really passionate. They do not want to duplicate the stupidity of their previous generations in terms of the destruction of the planet. They want to be living in lively urban areas. They want to socialize and be with friends and be physically um, and intellectually and culturally active. And you know, as I say, as a grandparent, uh, it's the frankly, it's the only thing I have hope for. Hey everyone, I'm John, and that was Dr. Richard J. Jackson, professor emeritus at UCLA in the School of Public Health, and author of two of the most influential books in my career, uh, Urban Sprawl and Public Health, as well as Designing Healthy Communities. Dick and I talk about both of these books, as well as the accompanying documentary to Designing Healthy Communities. But before we dive in, I just wanna say welcome and thank you so much for tuning in. I do this channel in the hope that I can help inspire the continued growth growth of this movement to create and promote a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. So having you here means so much to me, and it's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Dick Jackson. I am absolutely delighted to welcome a good friend onto the podcast, Dick Jackson. So wonderful to have you. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Great to be with you, John. Long time since I've seen you. Yes, yes. Gosh, when was that? It, it was definitely seeing you. Uh, was that in Louisville? Yes. Yeah, I, I was amazed by that great big baseball bat. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so since the last time, you know, you and I have spent any, you know, uh, amount of time together, uh, you've retired, correct? Well, I, I did not I didn't. Um, I was... My family's in Berkeley. I live here, um, and I was going to L.A. and teaching during the week, and um, it got to the point where I really wanted to think about what I wanted to think about and work what I wanted to work on rather than teaching. I had 200 students in my in the classes, so you can't wing it. you got to get up there, and you got to almost rehearse every line, every joke, everything else, and I loved it, but it was time for something else, and I will tell you, my big focus since becoming emeritus has been on climate change in the healthcare system. Uh, climate change is so immense, you, you have to pick something that you can get some credibility and substance into. So that's what I've been working on. Right, right. So I'll, uh, I'll reverse this back just a little bit to when I first got connected with you. It was really, and I'll pull pull this image up here on the screen for folks, and so that they can see it. Is it was really this book was my uh, initial introduction uh, to <laughs> who Dick Jackson is, and uh, that, this is two thousand four, correct? I th right, and uh, yeah. I had just left CDC. I was then state health officer, uh, answering to Governor Schwarzenegger when the book came out. Right, but uh, most all the work was done while I was at CDC with. Um, Larry Frank and Howard Frumpkin, the main lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I reached out to you very soon after uh, I read this book. It wasn't in 2004. It was probably more closer to the the mid to mid to later 2000s. And uh, and, and you were gracious enough to to have a conversation with me. I was still living. Laura and I were still living in uh, Hawaii at the time on the Big Island. And uh, I you know it was so wonderful to be able to strike up that conversation with you and, and, uh, eventually, uh, be able to, uh, not only have you <laughs> see you out on the big Island, but also be able to, uh, to meet up with you, um, at UCLA and, and which, you know, a, a few years after this book came out, uh, you ended up uh, there as a professor at UCLA. Wh what year was that when you made that shift? I went to UCLA in 2008, but there's a bit of background to this book, which I think your mm -hmm. listeners might find of interest. Yeah, let's dive in. I was at CDC and head of the head of environmental health, in essence, for the United States. And uh, every day, one day it was cruise ships, and the next day it was water pollution or air pollution or childhood lead poisoning. And living in Atlanta, I became aware that it took me a while. You know, my three kids were at three different schools and there were no sidewalks near their schools. And it hit me that, you know, one of the origins of public health 125 years ago was where people lived, how they got their air, their water and their food really mattered to their health. And we all got in cars in the early 20th century. 
and decided, well, that didn't matter anymore. Cars will solve all of our problems. And I wrote uh, a paper around 2000 with a wonderful fellow who um, had a physical disability on the built uh, on how we have built America's bad for people's health. And the side part of that story is I got really bashed. The National Association of Home Builders wrote a letter, uh, had a letter written by members of Congress telling CDC to fire that fool Jackson. He doesn't know what he's talking about. People in the suburbs live longer than the people in cities. Well, of course they do. They're a lot richer. But uh, so I, we began that we had to pull together the science and there was not much science. It's all in that book that said built environment really matters to health. And by the way, when I say pull it together, it really stuff since 1990 or so where you could search on the computers. And um, that is the first book that ever came out on this issue in over 100 years. Uh, and it really is about built environment and public health. And the subsequent books really deal with designing healthy communities and the built environment and health more right. broadly. And there will be a third uh, version coming out shortly. Now, if I remember the story correctly, there was e even like a very specific instance of of a, a report and 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 you bringing it up that it it wasn't walkable there at the CDC. Do I have that about right? You you do. This was um, the Surgeon General's reports. They're often written by CDC. CDC's got all the experts on whatever subject would many times would need to be talked about. And the Surgeon General wanted a report on physical activity and health. And so the CDC staff wrote this 250-page superb report on just how being physically active is good for you. And um, they came into Dr. David Satcher's office. He was then the head of CDC. And there were a dozen center directors sitting around. And they're all saying, this, this is why it lowers your blood pressure and your cholesterol and improves your attitude and it counters depression. And the room gets quiet. And finally, I said, Dr. Satcher, I don't think CDC has any right to issue this report. And the room got silent and everybody looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, there is not a sidewalk within two miles of CDC. You can't walk here. You can't bicycle here. There isn't even decent bus transportation here. It's totally car dependent. So we have no business to tell people to get out, walk, and exercise unless we can do it ourselves. And nobody liked hearing that after all the work that went into the report, but I think they also agreed. Right, right. And that really brings up a part of of you, who you are and your nature. You speak truth to power sometimes. <laughs> sometimes foolishly, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little red-haired guy from Newark, New Jersey, uh, and had to learn to, uh, you don't let people bully you, you know, don't get in fights unnecessarily, but right. if you think you're right, you got to push. Yeah, yeah. So, after you and I uh, connected and, and we started, you know, conversing and chatting, and I've even had the opportunity uh, to speak to your, your graduate class a couple of times, if I remember correctly. Um, but a PBS special came out and of, of the same name as this uh, companion book, that uh, uh, Designing Healthy Communities. And this was a wonderful um, narrative that came together in, in this documentary. And um, it was it was a series of profiles of cities, and it was so incredibly helpful to see something where there was hope built in, because if you can illustrate and do the, some storytelling of some things that positive things that are happening, it just makes all the difference in the world instead of just, you know, talking heads and, and quote unquote experts saying that we should be doing something starting to profile cities actually doing it, you know, not only pointing the problem out, but so doing, you know, doing these profiles. Talk a little bit about this experience. How long did it take to pull together the documentary and, and really get this out there? Because it seemed to me like it was quite an investment of, of, of a portion of your life. Around 2004, I met, I mean, actually more like 2008, I was at uh, UCLA and the good thing about UCLA is it's pretty close to Hollywood and there's all kinds of folks that have competence in this. One of the things I learned about video is don't do it badly. It really has to be done professionally. Uh, I met 
uh, Dale Bell, who was, by the way, one of the producers of the Woodstock, the movie, and Harry Wyland and uh, the Media Policy Center. And they said, you know, you're doing a good job. You're reaching 100 people a time, maybe once every other week. But that's not enough. You got to get it out this to get it out to a million people. And at the time, I was on the board. Uh, I was the public member of the American Institute of Architects board, and so I went to them and said, "You know, I want to do this PBS series, or our intention was for it to be PBS." And uh, they gave me gave us fifty thousand dollars to get it going. Well, that's very important because if you want to do one of these, you've got to raise money. So thanks to Kresge Foundation, thanks to the California Endowment and others, we were ultimately able to reach raise over a million and a half dollars to do the series. Uh, we had two to three camera crews in cities like Detroit and Atlanta and smaller crews in uh, cities that were easier to cover like um, Syracuse and Boulder. It was really an education for me. I, I learned so much in doing it and it was so important to have the people do the speaking. So in Boulder, the folks that designed those wonderful bikeways, by the way, it was the Olmsted sons that designed the bikeways that came down from the flat irons into uh, the city. But the crossing pathways that really helped people get around came later on. And it was easier. So when the neighbors are talking and people are smiling and saying, you know, I love living here because of this. Uh, I was very moved when I was in Detroit because I, shocking. I actually was, we were driving through town and we saw this mansion being torn down and somebody said, oh, that was Mitt Romney's home. That's where he grew up. Wow. And the destruction hmm. of urban areas and many blocks had one home on it. And so you can't create a community with one home. You can't get public services, police, fire or anything else with one home on a block across a neighborhood. Many other issues as well. But I, I learned so much. One particular interview that was very telling for me, and I say this at the time I had three um, sons living in Atlanta. Um, we interviewed a number of 15, 16 year old girls living in uh, a town, uh, Smyrna, near Atlanta. And the interviewer said, Well, um, how do you spend your time? Well, we get together and listen to music. Well, what else do you do? Well, um, we ask our parents to take us to the mall. And that their entire social life was circumscribed. And disabled by the physical environment and car dependent environments that they're living in. And uh, as bad as that was to hear it from folks with disabilities, to hear the same message from elderly who no longer could drive, um, it really was very moving to me. Um, and the one, the one shot, the one uh, camera thing of the whole thing was taken that everybody remarks on is was taken on Buford Highway in Atlanta, which isn't really a highway. It's a so-called state route, but it's a six lane wide road with a middle lane, a turn lane in the middle and miles between the crosswalks. And it was where my offices were. And uh, so the screenshot of the video scene was my trying to cross the street to go from one side to the other. Uh, it was probably one of my more foolish things. And everybody kept saying, why did you do that? That was dangerous. I said, these poor people are having to do it every day, sometimes dragging their children along and uh, carrying a shopping bag. This is not right the way we are building these communities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm going to flip over to another view here for just a second and pull up uh, the the actual documentary, um, as you had mentioned, was, was a PBS documentary. It went out on public television. Um, people can still watch it. So all these years later, uh, they can still gain access to it. And so uh, that is now available through uh, Canopy. And uh, as I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, as I understand it's it's available through public libraries. And um, I, I clicked on the watch now button earlier today and was was wanted to see what the process was. And it looks like if you're you can either be at the library or if you're a member of your public library, you can gain access to that. Is that what you understand as well? Yeah, I'm embarrassed. I didn't know this. And, mm -hmm. and uh, someone said, oh, you know, I'm assigning it in my class and the students uh, have to watch it before they come to class. That's good news and bad news. I'll tell you the bad news later. Um, the good news is that Canopy is available at most public libraries and most universities. Um, and K is with a K, K A N O P Y, um, and designing healthy communities, and there it is. Um, 
and it's sort of painless learning. And, and uh, I find that high school kids, even, you know, eighth grader, ninth graders really uh, get this. It's common sense to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad that uh, in your overview of, of, of the book and of the, the documentary, you, you mentioned um, Boulder. Boulder, of course, is, is like my second home. <laughs> I didn't know that. It, it is, I think one of the great things about the book is that's chapter eight. And what you focus on in chapter eight in the book about Boulder is, you know, sort of reducing that car dependency. And that also bleeds right into and and is connected to what you're so passionate about now in terms of climate. Because when we look at the challenge that we have ahead of us, you know, globally, um, we know that a significant portion of uh, our, our climate challenge is uh, associated with transportation. And um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, with COP26, uh, you know, during transportation week, uh, they didn't even have active mobility and, and cycling no. as part of the agenda. And so... Well, we've only been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> So anyways, long story short, thank goodness um, the, 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 Dice, the Dutch Cycling Embassy and the uh, European Cycling Union uh, scrambled, um, really put the word out worldwide. Active Towns did sign on to that open letter that was then delivered at COP26. And, um, and, and really, it's, it, it, I think it's part of the techno-narcissism that takes place is that we always assume that, you know, the electrification of the motor vehicle uh, fleet is is going to be enough. We don't have to work beyond that. But you and I both know that there, it's much more complicated than that. And community design is so incredibly important. And we have to be able to walk and bike, uh, you know, in our neighborhoods. I'll let you respond to that. And then I'm going to go back to another thing that I, I think I heard Um about Atlanta. So I'll let you respond to, to that particular um, issue first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stroll back into Atlanta. There was a, as everyone knows, two week meeting on the threat that climate change poses to us. And uh, when I lecture, I say, you know, when I started medical school, it was actually the month that the man landed on the moon and the planet had 300 um, and 14, 14 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, there are about three and a half billion people on the planet. We're now at 7.6 billion people on the planet. So it's doubled in the last 50 years. And uh, CO2 has gone up roughly 100 parts per million. And the planet has warmed about one and a half degrees, two degrees Fahrenheit. So I won't get into the long impacts of all of this, but one of the best ways to get energy is to burn the fat in your body and to burn what you eat effectively uh, and far better than using a manufactured, even a bicycle or something else to get uh, an electric bike to get somewhere is to actually use your own muscles. And that's good for your cholesterol. It's good for your mental health. It's it's actually, and depression is one of the most common disorders in America today, made worse, by the way, by lockdown and COVID. So any way we can get people out and active is to the good. Um, I, the well, let me stay there. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm so glad you you brought that up. Um, and what I really wanted to to do with bringing up uh, Atlanta was was to acknowledge that um, when you were there and and that situation came up. It was a different Atlanta that has has yes. sort of emerged over time. And so I, I know that uh, you, you had mentioned that you had three sons living in the Atlanta area. I believe now one of your sons is actually close by and, and where you're at now in the Bay Area. Um, but I believe you still have family in the Atlanta area, but things have changed now. There, are, It's not to say Atlanta is perfect. No place is perfect, but... Describe me what has developed and why it, it's it, it's getting a little better, a little more encouraging from an active mobility standpoint there. 
you know, a swelling because of good news and bad news. I, I gave a talk the other day um, about built environment and health, and I hate to admit it, but I got feedback. I said, well, everybody knows that. So that was part of the bad news of the video series that I, I have to um, dream up new. Th Where I'm going with that is my oldest son is a physician at CDC. Uh, they've got three and a fourth child on the way. They like Atlanta. They love the Beltline. They love the diversity and liveliness downtown. He bicycles to CDC every day, both ways. Um, he has found routes that he feels safe on all the way through. His wife actually is a doc at Emory, and she bicycled before she got pregnant. But, um, and I will say the electric bikes have been a big help because, as everyone knows, it's really hot in Atlanta a lot of the year, and you can't show up at work completely drenched with sweat. And yes, they have showers, but even so, um, it's a big help to have those, those bikes, and he can talk on his uh, helmet mic and all the rest. So, but he says, Dad, you just lived, you, you were here at the wrong time. But I will tell you, 20 years ago, we were being laughed at showing up at the Atlanta Regional Commission saying, you need to change these things. Oh, you can't change it. This is the way it is. People are too conservative. And in a way, this there's a kernel underneath this, which is I can get much further along talking about how – we can make your life and your children's life and your elderly parents' lives better than I can talking about the, pol the poles and ice melt and sea level rise. And I think carrying the message that this is really good for us and for our kids and our future, the thought I lost for a second ago, there were 30,000 children, young people marching in Glasgow um, for that COP26 event. And I think they may have been the most important participants in the whole thing because the older folks that think they've got all the answers better realize that the, the young folks really get this. And I've been very active with the uh, National Academy of Medicine that used to be uh, part of the National Academy of Sciences. And the opportunity and the challenge, medical care is about is about 18 percent of the GDP of the United States. It's about 10 percent of the American workforce and about 9 percent of our carbon footprint. And so rather than focusing on something big, and I think there's a larger message here, uh, and public health, medical care is big enough, this is a, an area where I can get a crowbar in and start to get attention and get the thing moving. And so I think a message for all of our listeners is picks don't the overwhelming thing is too big for any one of us. Pick something where you have an ability to change your your family, your community, your state, whatever it is, and and hammer away at that. Don't be careful about getting too broad because it it can be quite discouraging and exhausting. Yeah, yeah. I would even say that uh, to to echo what your your son was saying that. Uh, Yes, that's true that you were ahead of your time there, but I would also say that probably that part of your personality that doesn't shy away from <laughs> from uh, speaking truth to power uh, helped uh, it, move the needle forward and, and move that along because uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, you mentioned Beltline. A lot of our listeners, we've, we've got an international audience here, so a lot of our listeners may not know what the Beltline is. Why don't you explain that? About 20 years ago, there was a wonderful graduate student, Ryan Gravel, and a wonderful preceptor when he was at Georgia Tech, and he was given a project to do for his master's and master's degree, and as I understand the story, uh, found that there was Atlanta is where it is. It used to be called Terminus because it was the crossing point of many railroad lines. It was encircled by railroad and now abandoned railroad tracks. And Ryan laid out a plan to take those right, rights of way and turn it into a circle, a belt around the city. Um, it has been my son's opinion. And he has young children that he's taken for walks and rides and everything else. They love it. The uh, problem now is it's too crowded because um, everybody loves it, and that's not a bad problem to have, but they eventually may have to have two routes, one for wheeled vehicles and one for uh, pedestrians. Uh, the other negative, and Ryan's Gravel has been disappointed by this because it has caused quite a bit of gentrification. In other words, um, it is so attractive that uh, when you have land and properties that everybody wants, the price goes up and it begins to price out the communities that had been living there for a long time uh, and it was affordable. It also led to 
rehab of some spectacular old buildings. I think there was a, a Sears storage warehouse. You know, those places that were built a hundred years ago are very sturdy and they make for very good apartment buildings and other such things. And we, we ought to have density near these things so people can use them and get on public transportation and the rest. So, um, I think this challenge of gentrification is one uh, that I've been thinking about a lot. And when I was in LA, um, I and a whole bunch of other people were advocating to redo the Los Angeles River, the 54 miles. About half of it goes through the poorest parts of Atlanta with the least amount of parks, the most challenges with obesity and diabetes. And the folks that live there oftentimes work in downtown uh, Los Angeles and are biking on these narrow high-speed surface streets um, in the dark, in the winter, in the rain. And so creating a way that people could get to work safely, to see a bit of nature, to to uh, get that exercise, uh, it's crazy not to do it. And by the way, there was a plan in 1925 that the Olmstead Sons developed for the LA River, but we decided we'd just build all the way up to it and turn it into a concrete sluice. And so we were do spent a lot of time undoing the mistakes of uh, the early automotive era. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's been a frequent uh, a topic here on the podcast of, you know, the, the realities of gentrification. Um, and really, I, I, try to, I, I try to actually pause and say, in most cases uh, and in most circumstances, when we, we say the word gentrification, what we're really saying is, is displacement. Um, exactly. And so we, we have to continue to invest in these, especially underinvested areas and neighborhoods. And, and uh, in other words, my, 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 my point, of course, is, is that it shouldn't just be rich neighborhoods that it benefit from the ability to walk and bike places and have, uh, you know, activity assets, as I like to call them, uh, with active towns. It's like they, they definitely need that ability to be able to walk and bike use public transit and get to meaningful destinations. But we need to make sure that we have policies and programs and procedures in place to ensure that we don't have unwanted displacement of people who really want to be able to stay within their neighborhoods and be able to, especially if it's, if it's, you know, older uh, generations, if, if they, you know, desire to be able to age in place and want to still, you know, maintain that social cohesion that they have within their neighborhoods. And uh, so this is a, a common theme. I can think of uh, when you bring up Los Angeles, I think of, you know, the historic neighborhood where my family uh, originated from in the early 1900s in, in the Highland Park area of, of Los Angeles, you know, just north of the downtown area in between uh, downtown Los Angeles and Pasadena. And uh, uh, yeah, I hear you right, right along those lines. I think there used to be a bike route right through there from Pasadena yeah. to downtown. Yeah, there was. I don't know if it's been rehabbed or not. I... Okay, hang in there with me as I do respond to Dick's comment and I dug up a really cool photo that you'll see in just a moment. But first, I wanted to give you some exciting news. I have launched my Active Towns online store where you will find some fun Street Surfer People merch for sale. So check it out and help support the channel. The link is in the description below and in the show notes. Okay, let's get right back to it with Dick Jackson. It, that per, there was a couple of different ones. One of the most famous ones, and I'll be sure to uh, to, to include a photo of this one because it's it's really fun. Is that they did an elevated uh, bicycle freeway. The concept was uh, to be able to connect Pasadena to downtown Los Angeles on a an elevated uh, bicycle route. It was it was a private venture and they were going to charge people wow. to be able to access it. And yes, there are remnants of that right of way that still exists. So it's, uh, but it has not been rebuilt. <laughs> John, let me go deep for one second on yeah, this yeah, gentrification issue because, um, look, you need wealthier people in a neighborhood. Um, you need to have a tax base. You need to have policing and trash pickup and pressure for decent schools and eyes on the street and other such things. Everybody would agree that it's the government's job to make sure we've got clean air and clean water and clean food. Well, I think the government has not done enough to assure that people have adequate housing. And most of the, much of the housing, I grew up 
in the 50s in Newark, there were plenty of projects. And the projects that we, we call them the projects, a lot of the poor kids live there, and I knew some of the kids. Um, they were not great places to live. They really, and I hate this word, I'm going to use amenities. They, they were lacking in amenities. Somehow, trees and playgrounds and sight lines and safety and cleanliness, you know, if you don't maintain things, they, especially when you have 100 families living there, they fall apart. You have to take care of them. So we've really underinvested in housing and the housing needs of, of, really folks that don't have the depth of economic resources. Other countries, Germany gets this, other countries get it. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I love when you start looking at the economics, the household economics of of the challenge that's there is that if you have designed a community where people can get to their meaningful destinations uh, to meet their daily needs, they can, that really helps them to decrease their household budget because if they're not right. having to, to support multiple cars, you know, as a, you know, as a de facto, you know, to, as a, as a foundational expense to their household, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of savings to be able to free up to, uh, for housing, for other, uh, aspects of, of quality of life. So, you know, being able to have the ability to get to, uh, to school, to work, to the grocery store, to be able to walk and bike and use transit to, to be able to meet those daily needs is so incredibly important and helps. You know, there's a conflicting dilemma, dilemma yeah. in this too, which is, um, I, I've been the co-lead on the healthy campus effort in terms of the built environment at UCLA, mm -hmm. and we've gotten rid of about 700 parking spaces, which is very painful because parking spaces generate revenue. But parking spaces also cost more to build than an office. And so, um, you know, there's a love-hate relationship with parking, and I think this is true of many of our communities. In fact, one of my colleagues from UCLA, Donald Shoup, is the world's expert on on parking um, and has done a lot of thinking, for example, in Pasadena – different session, but uh, if you make the revenues actually from parking generate the liveliness of the street, you can actually get more benefit than a negative. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and in fact, uh, we're 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 big shoopistas here at Active Towns, and <laughs> and uh, we've had the shoop dog on the podcast uh, before, uh, and and yeah, no, he, he's he is a rock star. There's the absolutely no level. doubt. Students love him. And not only that, but cities love him, too, because yes. after they finally realize that there is the high cost of free parking, Pasadena is a great example. I mean, mm -hmm. I started off my career uh, right after graduate school, right there working on Colorado. And uh, I oh, remember <laughs> in the, yeah, the mid-1990s, I was there. And, you know, it's a much different Pasadena now because of the, the strategies of applying uh, you know, eliminating the, the, the free parking and, you know, having a, an intelligent design to parking so that you can reinvest that money in that neighborhood, on that block, in that district, and be able to have that very, very positive feedback loop of improving the environment and being able to, to you know, to make it more attractive. And they just had a, a complete turnaround in terms of the vibrancy of the neighborhood. You had more people living in that area now. You have more people shopping locally in that area. Uh, yeah, huge, huge success story. So, you know, John, a sidebar on this is I think yeah, yeah. we're charged by the weight and size of the vehicles too, because um, yeah. when I have to go to my medical appointments, uh, all the F-150s are hogging parking spaces. You barely can find a place to park. And I do have to drive there. Yeah. Well, the, the size and the weight of the motor vehicles is also a theme that's come up on the podcast a couple of times. And as we see the electrification of, of the fleet, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see, you know, a, a wholesale reduction of some of the challenges that motor vehicles present to our health and well-being and our environment. One of the, the, the factors is they're very, very heavy. <laughs> Your average, uh, you know, you know, luxury Tesla is an incredibly heavy vehicle. And so when we look at the pollution con, uh, you know, uh, impacts that we see from that vehicle, yes, we, we have a, a, a drastic reduction in emissions out of the tailpipe. Thank you very much. We absolutely do need that. But 
we still have the, you know, the microscopic particulate matter uh, that, you know, is coming off of the, the tires, especially with heavier vehicles. We still have the, the problem with the brake pads uh, that are contributing to the particulates that are, uh, you know, that are ambient. And we still don't have a, truly a solution in terms of just the traffic violence that's out on our roadways. And, um, and getting and the yes. traffic violence has gotten worse. And it has. And it has gotten yeah. worse. And, and again, I'm just not buying into the argument that autonomous vehicles are going to be our solution and, you know, we'll, we'll take care of that. And in an upcoming episode, we'll have uh, um, Dr. Peter Norton on to, to talk about autonomous vehicles a little bit more in depth. So stay tuned, listeners and, and viewers. We'll have more on, on that topic for sure. But let's stick with the, the climate side of this, uh, Dick, because you've been working so much and, and you're, you, you've been dedicating uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, you, you mentioned this to me in Louisville that you were starting to shift and focus some of your energy on this. But specifically, you mentioned it earlier, is climate change and medicine. What did you mean by that? One is the medical system can consume so much of the nation's wealth. Uh, you know, as I said, one sixth of the GDP. Every, and particularly during COVID, the quantities of waste coming out of a hospital are enormous. Every gown, and so getting away from plastic gowns, going back to washable uh, cotton gowns and um, cotton masks, uh, you'll still need disposable masks because you need that level of filtering as well. A, B, the whole pipeline of equipment, so much of it's now being imported. Mo most of our drugs, particularly the cheaper ones, are coming in from Asia. The, uh, many of them, you know, you know how hard it was to get a, a N95 mask uh, during that whole time. So developing a lot more of our infrastructure at home from sustainable facilities because we don't count the costs if they're made overseas. Um, so that would be another one. Uh, the I my medical school was UC San Francisco, right there uh, on Parnassus Avenue, overlooking the Golden Gate Park. Lovely location. That building's at about a hundred years, so it is at the end of its useful life, particularly the technology and everything else. And so it is going to be redesigned. One of the real tensions for the building redesign is there's a lot of pressure, economic and otherwise, to build for the year 2022 rather than to build for 2040. And there are technologies, whether it's photovoltaic thermal, so you can actually get both heat, um, much more efficient uh, energy transfer, um, you know, uh, so you can extract more heat from even colder air, colder water. And so, and, and you need a lot of hot water and steam in a hospital as well, and particularly in the laboratories. So the, the rethinking of the design of a hospital is going to be so important. A big one is... I'll tell a quick story, a pediatrician, and I remember being in my residency at that hospital, and I had a, I was caring for a bunch of children with respiratory diseases, terrible lung disease, some of them, and the power went out, and this was San Francisco, there was no air conditioning, and the windows were operable, so we opened the windows, and then the diesel burning generator goes on, and the black smoke is pouring up the side of the building, to the rooms of the children. So even things that aren't going to happen immediately, you have to be prepared for, and you have to have, you have to think about all these um, elements along the way. So uh, a big thing is to get the CEOs and the people running this system to decide this is really important. This is not a sidebar with a bunch of kids running around Glasgow. This is the reality that we are in. And by the way, a lot of these CEOs are hearing it from their own children why aren't you doing more? So that pressure is going on. I have found with um, getting the National Academy of Medicine folks to engage that the older docs, like myself, we get it. We're grandparents. We're very worried about the world we're giving. Um, and uh, the young docs get it, although there, a lot of them are overburdened with debt. And the middle career folks think, well, you know, I'm doing so much to save the world and save people already. I, I really don't have time for this. So creating that culture shift is going to be so important. And, and it always sounds rather nebulous to doctors, culture shift, but we did a culture shift with tobacco, really. If 30 years right. ago, you said there would be no smoking in, smoking in bars in New York, you would have laughed. Um, and we've, we're doing it more and more with sugar sweetened beverages and um, even exercise. So I think that is very important. And the other part of that is 
we docs, and by the way, every major medical society and group, so the pediatricians, the psychologists, psychiatrists, everybody are coming out with climate positions about what we need to do. But we have no business telling others what to do unless we're doing it ourselves. I remember I once had a dentist that smelled like tobacco and, you know, it's meaningless. You can't tell people what to do if they're not adhering to it. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. You you just mentioned you know that one aspect of you know the, the 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 medical equipment and the supply chain challenges and the fact that uh, it, because of the way COVID played out, we suddenly found our vulnerabilities be, became very very apparent. We couldn't get masks. Oh, and by the way. We're not manufacturing as much of our own equipment and masks. And oh, by the way, because this is another area of your your, your past interest in in and um, and study, is that when we are shipping everything in, and you and we think about we, it's in head, headline news right now, supply chain issues and the number of cargo ships that are sitting out in in front of the various ports. I think Oakland's doing a little better than Los Angeles and in. Um, and Long Beach, but it, it's just, it's horrendous the amount of air pollution that, that comes out because those cargo ships are burning bunker fuel. Talk right. a little bit about that because that's that's an area that takes takes us back to some of the work that you did, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I have two younger brothers. One worked for one of the major shipping companies, I won't say the name, and the other built ships and hatch covers and did repairs on them. The one is this Panamax and Super Panamax ships that can carry, and I'll make up a number now, 30,000 units. And when you look at these things, you you can't believe they don't tip over because they look so top heavy. And you know the story about, I think it was Bali or one of the more beautiful islands, maybe the Fiji, where a bunch of this stuff poured off and it had chemicals in it and all the rest. There is nowhere in, near enough oversight of international shipping. They've got to be burning fuels that are less polluting. I don't remember the exact number, but a significant portion of the Los Angeles Basin air, and believe me, California worked very hard, LA worked very hard to clean up its air. First ones to go to uh, catalytic converters and unleaded gasoline, and now to have its air being destroyed by the ships that are, and there are a hundred ships as we speak out off the Long Beach, Los Angeles Harbor, trying to get in to deliver their stuff. I get annoyed when I hear a news reporter say, well, there won't be enough toys for Christmas. Well, frankly, Americans have got too much crap already. We don't need to keep buying more stuff anyway. But That's I right. think the other, the other part of this is that we have stopped, you know, you go through the Midwest and people, the Rust Belt, and people are really struggling for jobs. And why aren't we making so much more of this at home rather than putting on a ship so that we can pay desperately underpaid folks in developing countries. I'm all for developing those countries, and that's one of the reasons we started a lot of this 30 years ago, but it's now become such an extreme level that we our loss of domestic manufacturing, textiles, you name it, has been, I think, it's a serious health um, impact at the same time. So... Um, and I'll just stay with that for one more minute because it goes to built environment. And you can't, You said you grew up in L.A., but Boyle Heights is right at the top of the 710 there as you go into the downtown. And some of the poorest people in L.A. live there. And you have trucks one after another after another rolling through there. And the big problem right now with trucks is they can't hire truck drivers because nobody wants to be sitting in a truck for 10 days at a time with their families coming apart and all the stress of that. It's unhealthy for your body to be sitting that long sleeping in a truck, but it's also unhealthy to be so socially isolated. So uh, I think there are a bunch over and over again in the health world. You look at one thing, you realize, oh, it's connected to 10 others. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that whole supply chain issue thing, you you also brought up the point that so much of of what we're consuming in in modern medicine is, is plastic, is tied to you know, essentially a petroleum, you know, chain of events. And and so uh, again, being, having an enhanced level of awareness, not saying that, you know, we can't use plastic ever, but being a little bit more intentional about the, those choices and those decisions and, and being, you know, 
upfront about what that connection to uh, the climate challenge, which is, you know, arguably the existential, you know, challenge that we face, you know, now and into future generations and future decades. Can I speak Um, a little bit about health impact assessment for one second? It sounds boring. You know, uh, early in my career, I probably read dozens, maybe a hundred environmental impact assessments. Mm -hmm. And they often were a thousand pages long, various chemicals or you name it. And they would deal with things that, you know, important things like um, Indian relics and noise and other such things. But the truth was only about the last three pages dealt with human health and impacts on human health. And in a way, well, originally when the NEPA was put in place, the National Environmental Policy Act, it intended for us to look at human health, but it was never done. It was made something that someone, a smart engineer with software could plug in a bunch of numbers and then say, well, you know, there's no impacts on this. So we need to do real health impact assessments. And I'll give you a concrete example. LA, biggest physical city in the United States, um, needs subways. And there is a subway literally as we speak being built. And we're looking forward to it at UCLA because it's going to be down the road on Wilshire Boulevard and it'll go out eventually, I think, to the beach. Um, and we need a subway coming down from what they call it the Valley, Van Nuys, and eventually through UCLA and down to the airport. Um, what an improvement that would be. And yet there was all kinds of opposition, including from the folks in Beverly Hills, because they didn't want the subway going under Beverly Hills High School. Well, you know, you can mitigate those threats. Yes, there's noise. Yes, there's this and that. But the long-term benefits and the health impact assessment showed that if you looked at cumulative risks and cumulative benefits, the benefits of building subway, increased walkability, improved air quality, less congestion, less stress, vastly uh, outmatched the um, negatives. And there will be negatives. And it's very medical in a way because everything in medicine that we do has a negative. You know, right. chemotherapy, radiation, you're always trying to optimize. And I think that's really what we should be doing with the built environment is how do we optimize for everybody, the young, old, and everybody in between? Yeah. Well, one of the things that has been a a reoccurring theme for me uh, throughout my career is looking, coming to grips with the modern medical um, approach of being in reactive mode versus being in preventative mode. And uh, I can't help but think that that's part of of what we have to be thinking about too for the future in, in, in relationship to not just, you know, public health and, and prevention of serious disease, but also as it relates to, to climate. And it, because when we think about you, you, you said it earlier, you know, the astounding numbers of, of what healthcare is in relationship to the GDP. I mean, it, and most of, I mean, I don't remember what the, the, the current statistics were, but back when I was in graduate school, the estimate was somewhere around 70% of all medical costs are associated with preventable chronic disease states. And so you have to think about, you know, what that opportunity, you know, has there in terms of being able to do what we can to prevent the preventable brings us right back to a lot of, you know, what both of our careers has been about now in terms of community design and being intentional about what the, the effects are, the unintended consequences. Probably um, about a third of all that money that's being spent, and I think it's now close to $4 trillion a year, goes into the medical care system. I don't call it health care because it's not right. really health care. It's medical care. Right. About 30% of it's going to administrative and paperwork and, you know, and everybody that's ever tried to get reimbursed for an ambulance ride and dealing with endless calls to the insurance company and you name it knows how difficult all of that is. Uh, A specific example was when Medicare put in place a rule that said, if a patient develops a a hospital infection, in a hospital uh, infection from being in the hospital and you discharge them, they have to come back in with to be treated for the infection that you gave them in the hospital. You hospital pay for that care. And 
it was the most effective way of getting them to really pay attention. And I mentioned that I was right. health officer under Governor Schwarzenegger, and I was really campaigning about hospital-associated um, infections. And I realized sitting in the room with these CEOs that they didn't care. This was a revenue generator. Why would you want to reduce the number of hospital-based infections? So the incentives have got to really change, that it's really about health. It's not about money. And yet you look at the top leaders of these places, um, of the hospitals, the one here in Northern California, Sutter, the CEO has been paid $18 million at the same time they couldn't figure out how to get enough masks for the nurses. And so I think the incentives are all going the wrong way. Yeah, Not all, yeah. but many of them are. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. The other thing that the other theme that really came about with the, the pandemic was realizing how much more susceptible um people were if they had underlying health care, you know, health conditions, if they were obese, if they, you know, had diabetes and some of those things. And it brings us right back to, uh, you know, again, health in the built environment and, you know, trying to do what we can to create communities that encourage healthier living. You know, the one thing you can't do anything about is age. Um, right. and that is a big, the biggest risk, for, risk factor for death for all of us. But, um, right. you know, Eventually, we're all going to die, but you want to die, you know, it ought to be uh, the right time in a sensible way. It's not because you didn't bother to get a shot or didn't get, take care of yourself. Right. Well, yeah. Or, or or just didn't, you know, have a community access, design. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that encourages you, that natural, natural activity of, you know, a, I spend, have been spending a lot of time in the Netherlands over the last uh, five, six years and- it's just so heartwarming to be there and to see people in their 80s, you know, still riding and and socially connected and engaged within their neighborhoods and their communities. And and you're like, yeah, I mean, this all makes sense. And so and those are sub themes that are part of of the Designing Healthy Communities um, book, as well as the PBS series uh, is it, it's not just when we think about healthy communities, it's not just you know, your blood pressure and your obesity, you know, status, it's also these other aspects, which is social cohesion and, and, and a lot of the other uh, very, very positive things. You mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, having a, a better mental health status too. You know, John, um, we make it easy to be unhealthy in our society. You know, the classic thing was putting all the junk food right at the checkout aisle at the eye level of a child. Right. Um, and we need to make it easy for people to be healthy. And right. we're doing we're doing a pretty good job in some places, but we could do a lot more. Yeah, yeah. What are you most encouraged about at this stage? You've been in this fight for a while, and and I know it's easy to get discouraged and beat down. So we're going to focus on uh, we're going to close this out with a, a bit of optimism. What has you really, really, you know, after a long hard day, <laughs> you've been beat up, and and the bad news is getting you, and and what what has you kind of smile and say, you know what, we have hope. You know, I I mentioned earlier giving a talk and and getting the feedback. Well, everybody knows that, and what really gives me the most enthusiasm is the young people I meet, the docs, yeah. the the uh, students at UCLA and everywhere I go. They're really passionate. They do not want yeah. to duplicate the stupidity of their previous generations in terms of the destruction of the planet. They want to be living in lively urban areas. They want to socialize and be with friends and be physically um, and intellectually and culturally active. And, you know, as I say, as a grandparent, uh, it's the, frankly, it's the only thing I have hope for because so many other indicators point in the wrong direction. And I think we're handing this off to a very energized and smart generation. I, I hope they're practical because some of the things that I've heard proposed, I don't think are very practical. So, of course, I did the same thing 50 years ago. And, um, you know, you get wiser after you lose, get beat up a few times. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Well, I can't think of a better place to end this on is a little bit of hope and, and optimism. And, and I agree. I mean, it's, that's really what makes me sort of perk up and smile a little bit from ear to ear is, is seeing the amount of optimism and, and passion and, and sense of urgency. And I think Greta yes. did a great job of bringing that sense of urgency 
especially to the climate change, um, you know, message is we, we need to do this. And, you know, and, and she calls us old guys out and says, you know, we, this is our future. And so we are speaking up and we're, you know, get out of the way because we're coming through. So a I'm with you. that's gratifying yeah. on that, John, is, you know, I started out, I'd expect to hear from public health students. I get as many calls from the business school and the law school and even the medical school and the nursing school. Um, and there is an outpouring of smart young people that look at the world and go, I've got to do something. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Dick, it has been such a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you for pleasure joining for me. me on the Active Towns podcast. My pleasure. Great to be with you. Thank you also very much for tuning into this episode featuring Dr. Richard Jackson. Obviously, I highly recommend both his books, especially the more recent of the two, Designing Healthy Communities. I have links for them in the description below and in the show notes. Now, if you found this episode helpful, interesting, and inspiring, please give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, and subscribe to the channel. This really helps out a great deal. Oh, and don't forget to check out my new Active Town store for some zany Streets Are For People merchandise. Well, that's all for this episode. So until the next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>